Let's get to it. We always do the etymology, so um, this is especially pertinent tonight, the etymology of the word education. It is Latin. It means, means to bring out or lead forth from, to lead, to bring out of, educare, educere. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> pedagogue or pedagogy in Greek means to lead the child. Um, so to take the child is actually used of a slave, person who would take the child to school and then later gets morphed into the teacher. So in both of those terms, we get this notion of movement, <clears throat> this notion of motion. Um, something is happening here, right, in education. It, it's to move from one state of being to another. And in that sense, it's like a ritual, very much like a ritual. And education is ritualistic in the best and worst senses, as you all know. So what is this movement? What happens when you are educated, when you are led out? What are you led out from? And what are you led out to? Well, we're going to talk about that the rest of the night, starting with Plato and his Republic. 428 to 348 BCE, the Republic, one of the great texts of Western literature, where Plato <clears throat> describes and argues for his own utopia. It, that's not fair. It's not a utopia. It's just an ideal system of government, which is not democracy, by the way, because democracy sucks, as we're learning. Um, no, Plato did not think that ordinary people should have a say in anything. <laughs> you know, uh, they weren't smart enough. And in fact, that becomes uh, the center of the republic is you can't let anybody run a country or a city-state. Oh, no. I know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, when the... <coughs> so, um, Plato thought that people must be trained morally to prevent corruption. Um, and to do that, you had to control the content of what they learned. Now, this is where Plato kicks the poets out of his republic because they tell stories. And by poets, he typically means tragedians like Aeschylus, whom we talked about, playwrights. And <clears throat> you can't be depicting uh, sons marrying, having sex with their mothers and killing their fathers. You ought not do that, Plato says, because it'll give people ideas. <laughs> <laughs> really, Plato? Everybody's just dying to do that, and once they see it on the stage, it's going to urge them onward. But his point is better than the one I'm kidding him about. <clears throat> and one that we know is that what comes in affects you. And, and that's the gist of his argument, is that you must control the content, because not everything, in fact, very few things, provide education. Very few things put you where you need to be. To, very few things lead you out. Most things keep you back. And that's a fair point. And so Plato's Republic is inevitably and invariably conservative. You must keep things the way they are. This is all a conservative means, or, or used to mean, I'm not sure, is you don't want to see change. William Buckley said, uh, a conservative is one who stands athwart history and says, stop. And I don't think he was kidding. I think he really meant that, the famous conservative William Buckley. Uh, and of course, the opposite of that is a progressive person who is in, engaged with change and wants to see it happen. For Plato, you must conserve things. You must keep things together. You must hold them together by enforcing the old and preventing the new from coming in. And so you poets, you with your tales, mm -mm, don't want that in the Republic. You're, you're um, mimicking <clears throat> bad behavior. 
you're demonstrating, showing bad behavior on the stage and in your tales, and we can't have that because there can be no bad exemplars. So, no bad examples to follow or to not follow, as the case may be. Um, by the way, there's a great, thank you, yeah, that's Ella Baron for the Times Literary Supplement. <laughs> In Plato's cave, everyone's on their devices. So, Plato then, really Socrates, but really Plato, moves to um, the discussion of the philosopher king <coughs> through the allegory of the cave. Now, forgive me if you've heard this before, <coughs> but it is important, it is central, in fact, to Plato's understanding of education. What you're leading, what you're being led from, and what you're being led to. So Plato describes um, in the Republic a, a cave, and hu there are humans in the bottom of this cave, and they are chained from birth facing a wall. And behind them there is a kind of ledge, and, and there's a fire behind them. And people are carrying things back and forth across this wall. And so that's a very elaborate way of saying that the people in the cave see shadows. That's the whole point of all that. They see shadows of things, right? And, and that's their life. They see the shadows. They know nothing else. And so that's their reality. It's not a bad reality. I mean, compared to what? Compare, I mean, they're fed. We assume they're fed. They can't move, but they have entertainment. Um, it's basically a screening room, this cave. Um, same movie over and over, so that's probably going to get old. But having no other experience of reality, you and anyone chained in this situation will see the shadows as the reality. As Glaucon, his interlocutor, says, it's a strange image and, a stra and strange prisoners you're telling of. <laughs> like Agent Cooper, it's a strange and wonderful world, Diane. Um, now, of course, that's boring. We don't want to leave it there. Uh, there has to be an unchained prisoner dancing to an unchained melody. No, I'm just seeing if you're listening. You're not, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Wendy, I know you are. Okay, so imagine, Socrates says, if we take one of these people from the cave and remove him outside into the light, what's gonna happen? Well, first of all, it's gonna hurt. Uh, he's gonna be pained by the light. He won't be used to the light, and so he will recoil from the light, and then as he acclimates to the light, he will see things he's never seen before. He will see things three-dimensionally, assuming that you can't see the prisoner chained beside you, you know, let's not take it too literally. He will see things like he's never seen before. Now, you, have, you tell him that his experience in the cave is not real. What's he going to do? He's going to rebel. And he, he's going to rebel logically because his sense data for all his life has told him that what you're now showing him is not real, not what he's lived. You see the application to education? <laughs> this is my job <laughs> as a professor. I, I remember teaching, a, my first job was at a small liberal arts college in the South, and they made me teach Bible, and I said, you don't want me to teach Bible. <laughs> and they said, no, you have to teach Bible. And, and so, you know, I brought these poor kids out into the light, <clears throat> and they rebelled and called me Satan and all kinds of things. It, it's a difficult thing to come into the light. You won't believe it. Uh, because you, you have a paradigm of reality and it sets in. Reminds me of uh, the Thomas Kuhn example in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revelation. Um, revelation? No. Revolution. Sorry, God, thank you. Revelation, that would be a good title. 
Anyway, the structure of scientific revolution, where he talks about how science proceeds, and he tells a story. He says science proceeds via paradigms, which I would call myths, stories that hang together and explain the world. And he, he talks about how powerful these paradigms are. And there was a, apparently this is an actual experiment where <clears throat> uh, they had some people in a room, I don't know, three or four people, and they had uh, a card deck. And there was one anomalous card. There was maybe a red two of spades, right? An anomalous card. Wrong. Doesn't belong in the deck. So they set them down, and they, they were scientists, so they were just doing their thing. They're like, all right, <clears throat> you see anything wrong with these cards? Nope, all good. Second round, they slow it down. See anything wrong with these cards? Nope, perfectly good deck of cards. They do this over and over and over again, about a dozen times. And you know what happens? Does someone say, oh, you know, a two of spades should be black, not red. No, that's not what they say. They get pissed. They're still not registering it, but they're getting pissed because they keep seeing these cards and they know something's wrong, but they can't see it. They feel it. And so they get angry. And finally, I think one person on like the 15th time, and now they're holding the card up right for like three or four seconds at each card three or four, and finally somebody goes oh my god that's wrong this is what it means to come out of the cave um you you have to bring people out by force and that's what socrates says um we would drag him away from there by force along the rough steep upward way and didn't let him go <laughs> before we had dragged him out into the light of the sun. And indeed, isn't that education? You're being dragged up the mouth of a cave against great protest. Uh, and then you are told that this is your reality and you utterly reject it. <clears throat> First, this person would see shadows, then reflections, then things, then all these other things. Um, but finally, <clears throat> Socrates says, once you explain to him, once you teach him what's really real, he becomes much happier, having seen things the way they are. And then you send him back to the cave <laughs> to tell all the other people chained there. And um, Socrates says, well, if he tries to go back and help the other prisoners, they will hate him. They will call him corrupt and delusional because they are still in the old paradigm, the shadow paradigm. Um, and this is Socrates' example of the good. <clears throat> so what uh, the sun in this analogy is the good, one of the greatest of the forms. All right, so that's how it works in Plato, really Plato's uh, Republic, using Socrates as his voice. And so here's where we've got to be. We can't be messing around with the shadows, right? Because the shadows are not real. You can't be fooling around with them. Even though that may be what you know and what you think is real, you can't do it. So in the, the young, the young people in this republic, we don't let them argue. They can't argue because they don't know what they're doing. And so uh, there's no Twitter in the Republic. Um, again, this is a very conservative notion of Plato's. Older educated men, however, will discuss and consider the truth rather than the one who plays and contradicts for the sake of the game, you youths, right? Old educated men. We need so much more of them. Um, when they are 35, those men, and it is men, well-trained in dialectics, will be required to go back into the cave, essentially, to go out among the people, to hold offices, and testing will continue. And finally, at the age of 50, those who have excelled in everything will perceive the good, the sun, and will alternate philosophizing 
and ruling the city. Uh, Socrates says this of these philosopher kings, and lifting up the brilliant beams of their souls, they must be compelled to look inward, to look toward, sorry, not inward, to look toward that which provides light for everything. Once they see the good itself, they must be compelled, each in his turn, to use it as a pattern for ordering the city, private men, and themselves the rest of their lives. For the most part, each one spends his time in philosophy, but when his turn comes, he drudges into politics and rules for the city's sake. Not as though he were doing a thing that is fine, but one that is necessary. And thus always educating other men, other like men, and leaving them behind in their places as guardians of the city, they go off to the isles of the blessed and dwell. Okay, so that's our heritage in Western culture is these philosopher kings who contemplate the good, occasionally get their hands dirty with politics and ruling the city only to correct things, to conserve the norms, to prevent the repetition of bad behavior being displayed in the Republic. And then we just go off to the Isles of the Blessed and dwell. That's why I got a philosophy degree. Okay, good. Still waiting for that to happen. Now notice what happened, what's happening here. Who's not mentioned? Right? We have the philosopher kings. Well, really the philosopher king. We have the candidates for the philosopher king. And we have the guardians. Nobody else is mentioned. Because those are they who must be controlled. That's you and me. They must be controlled. We must be controlled. Why? Because we're slaves to our appetites. Slaves to our passions. We don't know anything. We cannot be trusted with ourselves and certainly not with society. And so we must be guarded by the guardians. So what we train are not the people, the demos in Greek, but the guardians, the people who control the guardians. This is the philosophy of education that was founded by Plato and continues to this day. The guardian, we train guardians. We don't train people. We educate people to maintain the society as it exists. Thank you, Wendy. We do not educate people to change society. We educate people to maintain society. And in the process, we tell them that they're practicing freedom. Right? Now, sure, there are, there are good schools, there are good institutions, but I, I'm talking about the general thrust of education in every society. It happened in this country, for example. Education from the beginning of this country uh, as a Euro-American uh, institution was education of the elite. And Harvard was founded in 16-whatever, in Yale not long after, in Princeton, et cetera, the Ivies. Those were not for you and me. Forgive me if I'm bringing you down to my class level, but <laughs> I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> Those are not for us. They never were for us. They were actually there to train ministers. That was their primary and first function. Uh, even so, it was always education for, it was liberal arts education, which we understand as the practice of freedom, but they understood for what it really was, the education of the free ones. Right? The liberal ones, the free. It was the education of free people. And so now it becomes pretty clear, right? Who could not go to school uh, in the early and up to the 20th century? Um, women, I mean, past, who could not go to college? Uh, women, people of color. Uh, any, only white men could go to school because those are the guardians. Or, the, well, they're really the philosopher kings. 
Um, but as Plato said, you, you need them in both areas for a little while. Now, something interesting happened in American history in um, the mid-20th century is we fought in two world wars, and when we came back, um, the, the U.S. government created something called the GI Bill. And it said, you know what? You won a world war. You saved the planet. Thank you. Here's a free education. Um, many of you or your parents uh, benefited from that. It was a staggering, it had a staggering impact on this culture. Now, did those veterans, many of whom had just a high school education, if that, did they go to Harvard and Princeton and Penn? No, 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 no. We created special schools for them called land-grant universities, and we trained them to be guardians, right? So education in America continued, it began as education for the free ones, the liberal arts. It continued, that continued, and it still does today, but in 1945 and thereafter, we created a massive and wonderful education bill that allowed people to get an education. And what did we do with that? How did we educate them? We educated them to be workers. That's not a bad thing in principle because you need a job. But we did not show them the sun. We did not bring them into the light. Now, I've been in this gig for a long time, so I, I know what you're going to say, and you wouldn't be wrong if you said, hey, there was, there's a general education program in these schools, and, and I'm a big believer in that, <clears throat> and have created a few myself. But you probably know that your general education was not quite as serious as your major um, or your graduate degree. General education was a requirement. Uh, that was not, uh, more often than not, met with grudging attendance. I know, I, that's all I ever teach is general education. Uh, but that's where you could see the sun if you wanted to. That's where teachers could lead you out of the cave. Now, if, if we wanted people to be educated, to be truly free, that's where all the money would go. That's where all the professors would go. Not into graduate programs, not into research, but into educating the general, general education. All right, let me, I got off on some stuff there. So. We educate the guardians. And we educate the guardians to protect the elite. And that is education in America. Now, in 1967, uh, well, actually 72, there was an amazing book that came out, and I want to spend the rest of my time tonight with you leading you through this book a little bit, because it's worth me just letting you hear this voice. And I don't know if you know this text, but it's called Pedagogy. Oh, you do, right? What's that? I'm not, but we can. <laughs> <laughs> a lovely wizard-like man named Paolo Ferre uh, wrote this book in 72 called Pedagogy of the, Press, the Oppressed. He lived from 1921 to 1997. And he lived in northeast uh, Brazil and suffered terribly uh, under colonialism and uh, all sorts of political upheavals. This informed his philosophy of education, his pedagogy, if you will. You recognize the word there from the Greek. Uh, here's what he says. I didn't understand anything because of my hunger. Start there. I didn't understand anything because of my hunger. You can't learn if you're thinking about your next meal and actually wondering where your next meal will come from. I wasn't dumb, he says. It wasn't lack of interest. My social condition didn't allow me to have an education. 
Experience showed me once again the relationship between social class and knowledge. And you may recall the great Virginia Woolf in her essay, A Room of One's Own, who talks about material conditions that are required for a woman to be a writer. Why are there no women writers? Well, you don't give them a room <laughs> to write. And uh, in her brilliant essay, she describes uh, Shakespeare's sister and why you haven't heard of Shakespeare's sister, who no doubt existed, meaning a, a writer like Shakespeare uh, of that quality who was a woman, because she was taking care of Shakespeare or, or her husband or and the kids and the house and everything else. She had no private space. So, Paolo Ferre is neo in the, Marxist in this sense, uh, but so was Virginia Woolf in that. And this is a fair observation, is that you need a space, you need a material space in which to be free. In fact, the lack of freedom is defined as the lack of such space. That's why we put people in jail, right, to remove that space. This pedagogy of the oppressed that he developed begins with the teacher mingling with the community, asking questions of the people. And I love this, just gathering a list of words that they use in their daily lives. Just tell me the words you use in your daily lives. And that, from that, the teacher can understand the social, help to understand the social reality of the people and lead discussions in class based on these words in the cultural circles, Ferre called it. The, the ultimate point being, for Ferre, literacy, learning to read and write. That was his whole point. In 1962, the first experiment with Ferre's community, uh, cir cultural circles, 300 farm workers were taught to read and write in 45 days. 300 farm workers now are literate in six weeks. As a result, the government approved thousands of cultural circles to be set up in Brazil until what? Power. Until a coup in 1964 in Brazil changed his life. And a decade later, Ferre would be jailed. Power in education, right? Why is it that authoritarian regimes hate education? Why is it that they do re-education? Is because that's where the power is. The intelligentsia are always targeted first because they are teachers in their own right, writers, uh, performers, artists. They are the teachers. They must be stopped. So, if you don't mind, I want to take you through as much of this book as we can tonight because it is extremely dense, meaning it's packed tightly, but it is very accessible. And this is a philosophy text, too, so he's, he's quoting not just Marx, but German philosophers, and Bergson, and all kinds of people. I want you to hear what he has to say because I can't think of any better statement on power in education than Paolo Ferre's. And then I'm hoping tonight, maybe during the discussion, we can share some stories of power and education in our own lives. He says this, the goal here is humanization. Humanization. Quote, but while both humanization and dehumanization are real alternatives, only the first is the people's vocation, not dehumanization. This vocation is constantly negated Yet it is affirmed in that ne very negation. That's exactly what I was talking about just before. Why is education so threatening to authoritarian regimes? They must negate it. Really? That's what you want to go after? Teachers? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly who you want to go after. And in the negation, it affirms their power as it takes it away, right? 
It is, he continues, it is thwarted by injustice, exploitation, oppression, and the violence of the oppressors. It is affirmed by the yearning of the oppressed for freedom and justice and by their struggle to recover their lost humanity. I love this. Listen to this. The goal is liberation, freedom. The title of the lecture tonight is The Practice of Freedom. That's not my phrase. That's Paolo's. This, then, he says, is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed, to liberate themselves and their oppressors. The oppressors who oppress, exploit, and rape by virtue of their power, cannot find in this power the strength to liberate either the oppressed or themselves. Only power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed will be sufficiently strong to free both. It's genius, right? Because even though you hold a position of power, you are also constrained by that very position. You, you are limited and what you can do in terms of humanistic value. You can only replicate the power structure. We talked about that a little bit with institutions. Institutions exist only to continue themselves. Any attempt to soften the power of the oppressor in deference to the weakness of the oppressed almost always manifests itself in the form of false generosity. You know what? Here, you do your little honors class on uh, the occult and wisdom in America. Go ahead. You do that. False generosity, right? Because it's not a threat. If I put you over here and make you not part of the main uh, institution, I can give you that. In fact, I can give you all kinds of freedom within this little circle. And now you think you're free. But I gave you that, and I gave you that to keep you in the larger circle where I do have control. In order to have the continued opportunity to express their generosity, the oppressors must perpetuate injustice as well. An unjust social order is the permanent fount of this generosity generosity which is nourished by death, despair, and poverty. That is why the dispensers of false generosity become desperate at the slightest threat to its source. The oppressors are themselves oppressed. Palo Ferre. But almost always during the initial stage of the struggle, and I apologize that this has no relevance in America in 2019, <laughs> During the initial stage of the struggle, the oppressed, instead of striving for liberation, tend themselves to become oppressors or sub-oppressors. The very th structure of their thought has been conditioned by the contradictions of the concrete existential situation by which they were shaped. This ph phenomenon derives from the fact that the oppressed, at a certain moment of their existential experience, adopt an attitude of adhesion to the oppressor. But their perception of themselves as oppressed is impaired by their submersion in the reality of oppression. Um, there were, during uh, the 19th century, uh, especially in the plains, there were what was called hang around the fort Indians, right? So it's the 19th century. Indigenous populations are being decimated. And so some people in some tribes started hanging around the fort. Hey, you need anything? Want me to be a scout? I can be a scout. Want me to water your horse and take care of your horse? Any of that? Hang around the fort. We have to ask if we're hanging around the fort, if we're serving the oppressor with the illusion of freedom. And he does not let the oppressed off the hook on the other end either. He says this, the oppressed, and by the way, he, he, means, he doesn't mean Brazilians in the mid 20th century. He means anyone who's oppressed. Uh, anyone who is 
the victim of a power structure. The oppressed, having internalized the image of the oppressor and adopted his guidelines, are fearful of freedom. Freedom would require them to eject this image and replace it with autonomy and responsibility. Freedom is acquired by conquest, not by gift. It must be pursued constantly and responsibly. Freedom is not an ideal located outside of human beings. Uh, now we've left Plato. Freedom is not an ideal located outside of human beings, nor is it an idea which becomes untrue. It is rather the indispensable condition for the quest of human completion. Freedom. When they discover within themselves the yearning to be free, the oppressors, the oppressed, perceive that this yearning can be transformed into reality only when the same yearning is aroused in their comrades. This is why I'm not a tax resistor. I'm too afraid that you all won't follow me. And you won't. You'll leave me hanging. I know you will. The IRS comes to my house and you're like, I don't know, that guy, I thought he looks a little familiar, but <clears throat> we are afraid and we have reason to be afraid of our freedom from these power structures because they're not inert power structures, they're power structures and you will pay a price for your freedom. In fact, Paolo says you have to pay a price or it's not freedom. They prefer gregariousness to authentic comradeship, the oppressed, he says. They prefer the security of conformity within their state of unfreedom to the creative communion produced by freedom and even by the very pursuit of freedom. The pedagogy of the oppressed, Paolo says, has two distinct stages. In the first, the oppressed unveil the world of oppression and through praxis, activity, commit themselves to its transformation. We, we can go there. We maybe already are there. In the second stage, in which the reality of, the, of oppression has already been transformed, this pedagogy ceases to belong to the oppressed and becomes a pedagogy of all people in the process of permanent liberation. In both stage, stages, it is always through action in depth, action in depth, that the culture of domination is culturally confronted. In the first stage, this confrontation occurs through the change in the way the oppressed perceive the world of oppression. To, you must see it, right? You must see outside the cave. You must see the anomalous card. That's the first step. You can't see the anomalous card. You're going to be going to war over the perfect reality of the deck that is not perfect, that is anomalous. I love this so much. I, I've never read anyone like him who is so broad-minded and deep in his analysis. He says, it is only the oppressed it is only the oppressed, you and me, who can free their oppressors. They're not going to free themselves. Why would they? They're, they're deep in the cave, but their cave is catered. <laughs> and it has a hot tub. Why would they leave? The latter, the oppressors, can free neither, them, neither others nor themselves. It is therefore essential that the oppressed wage the struggle to resolve the contradiction in which they are caught. And the contradiction will be resolved by the appearance of a new person, neither oppressor nor oppressed, but a human being, in the process of practicing freedom. If the goal of the oppressed is to become fully human, they will not achieve their goal by merely reversing the poles of the contradiction, right? This is feminism. Feminism never wanted to reverse the poles, at least the feminist theorists and critics that I read. It wasn't about reversing the poles. It was about eliminating the dichotomy, right? And moving into a new third thing that 
is only amorphous at this point. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it's like every paragraph has these lines that just like, here's another one on bureaucracy. So you think, right? And you, you read about education and you listen to educa educators and maybe you have a kid and you talk to your teacher and you think, well, why can't we just do this? Paolo, the moment the new regime hardens into a bureaucracy, the humanist dimension of the struggle is lost and no longer possible to speak of liberation. The moment it becomes an institution, all is lost. Because remember, an institution exists for the sake of the institution, not for its members, but for itself. And so all is lost. And as an educator, I cry, I'm guilty of this. Uh, and most educators are, and especially most administrators, because administration of an educational program is about creating bureaucracy. And you, and you know, you have good reasons for creating your bureaucracy. I understand it. It's there to protect others and this and that. And, you know, that's, and then so we have an institution and we've lost our freedom. The oppressors now, as this movement begins, the oppressors now begin to feel oppressed. Have you heard this? But, uh, Paolo, but when the contradiction is resolved authentically by new situation established by the liberated laborers, the former oppressors do not feel liberated. On the contrary, they genuinely consider themselves to be oppressed. And I believe them, honestly I do, because they're in the cave, right? And we're trying to drag them into the sun and it hurts. And why would I leave my cave with the catering and the spa? Um, they consider themselves to be oppressed and all you have to do is watch cable news and you'll see this tonight. I guarantee you, you'll see some rich person tonight saying, oh my God, this is like the Jews. I feel like I'm one of the Jews. I mean, really? But you know what? I don't doubt that feeling on their part. Because the loss of power feels that way. We know it, right? It does feel that way. And sure, your, your scale is all out of whack, dude. And you're whacked. But, you know, come into the light. Come on. You know, don't, don't defend your life in the cave. Formally, they could eat, dress, wear shoes, be educated, travel, and hear Beethoven. While millions did not eat, had no clothes or shoes, neither studied nor traveled, much less listened to Beethoven. Yeah. Any restriction on this way of life in the name of rights of the community appears to the former oppressors as a profound violation of their individual right. Although they had no respect for the millions who suffered and died of hunger, pain, sorrow, and despair, they didn't care about those rights. <clears throat> For the oppressors, human beings refers only to themselves, other people or things, but simply conceded of the oppressed to survival. And they make this concession only because the existence of the oppressed is necessary to their own existence. See if, yes, go ahead, Simon. We just talked a little bit more about this, this idea of the, the uh, oppressors being the oppressed. Yes. Um, it's not that easy to leave the cave as the oppressor, and I think maybe we should unpack that a little bit. It, and the, the equation between denying myself the offer or flying to a different country, it's not that easy an equation. No, it's not easy so at all. The struggle is to how, how does, does one operate morally or ethically given the, the history of colonization and oppression? Yes. Hierarchy. Yes. It's not just as easy as buying fair trade coffee or, yes. uh, or wearing second hand pants. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's really complex. And it is. It's just, um, it, I'm often, I, often I find there's like an oversimplified equation or exchange that, that, that happens um, that sort of denies the intense complexity. Um, 
of these, of these, of these uh, propositions. I think that this is the paradox that's being presented here, but it I'd is. love to talk about that more. Sure. The group or the opinion on it, but yeah, like well, the idea of the, of, of the oppressor being the oppressed. Yeah. Uh, let me say a word about it, and then I think we're going to come to that certainly in the discussion. We should, because you're right, it is very complex. Um, not to pander, <laughs> but I believe this is why this institution's here, is because we recognize all seekers. And we had a discussion uh, during the Los Angeles series about, you know, people who are seekers here who just hop from one thing to another. And it's easy to dismiss them, but I will always defend them because those seekers are still seeking. At least you're looking outside the cave. At least you're turning your head, you know? And I think it's incredibly unfair of us to demand that they act like they've seen the sun. You've got to honor the path. As long as that path does not involve violence or verbal violence, as long as it's seeking, I want to honor it. You know why? Because that was me. Because I was a dumbass seeker. I, I didn't have power, but I was just bouncing around to what, with what I knew. And that's all you can go with until you find kind of the edge of it. Or you, Campbell would say you get the call to adventure. Right? And it, that call may be dramatic. It may be a white rabbit that comes along and talks to you. Or it may just be restlessness and boredom. Um, so that's my answer. Is it's incredibly complex. And we hurt the seeker if we deny her the first steps. Because she doesn't look like us. And because we're up here in the sun and we can see. But she can't see. She's still... Anyway... Let's come back to that for sure. See if this rings true for you as fellow oppressed people. Self-deprecation. Self-deprecation is another characteristic of the oppressed, which derives from their internalization of the opinion the oppressors hold of them. Internal coloniz colonization, he will call this. So often do they hear that they are good for nothing, know nothing, and are incapable of learning anything, that they are sick, lazy, and unproductive, that in the end they become convinced of their own unfitness. It's kind of what I was just talking about with Simon. You, you must allow people room to grow. You must allow them a space to practice freedom. Even the oppressors, but especially the oppressed because it's internal. The colonization, the racism, the sexism, it's all internalized. Sure, we can see it out here and mark it and say that's bullshit and no and no and no and yes to the people fighting that, but it's still all in here and you've still got to deal with it in there. The peasant feels inferior to the boss because the boss seems to be the only one who knows things and is able to run things. Goddess, forgive me, I did this in my youth as a professor because I had this thing called a PhD and I thought it meant I could inflict things on people. And I did because I was speaking from an institutional position of power. I was messing with my philosophy students uh, down at studio school, and I, I went off on some totally bullshit, random philosophy that I was making up as I went along. And, and they totally bought it. And I said, why would you believe me? And they said, well, because you have a PhD and you're standing in front of us. And I'm like, here is the lesson, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't believe anybody. <laughs> Um, but we all know that. Um, we feel inferior to people because they have and do more than we do. Ferret continues, they call themselves ignorant, the oppressed, and say the professor is the one who has knowledge and to whom they should listen. The criteria of knowledge imposed upon them are the conventional, conventional ones. Why don't you, said a peasant, 
participating in one of my cultural circles, says Paolo, explain the, fi the pictures first. That way it'll take less time and we won't get a headache. <laughs> right? And here we come to, oh my goodness, where did the time go? Here we come to his most well-known and powerful concept, the banking concept of education. <clears throat> education, he says, thus becomes an act of depositing in which the depositories and the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. Instead of communicating, the teacher issues, communiques, and makes deposits, which the students patiently receive, memorize, and repeat. This is the banking concept of education in which the scope of action allowed to the students extends only so far as receiving, filing, and storing the deposits. They do. It is true, have the opportunity to become collectors or catalogers of the things they store, but in the last analysis, it is the people themselves who are being filed away through the lack of creativity, transformation, and knowledge in this misguided system. All right. The practice of oppression in education is this, Paolo says. The following attitudes and practices. The teacher teaches and the students are taught. The teacher knows everything and the students do not. The teacher thinks and the students are thought about. The teacher talks and the students listen meekly. The teacher disciplines and the students are disciplined. The teacher chooses and enforces his choice and the students comply. The teacher acts and the students have the illusion of acting through the action of the teacher. The teacher chooses the program content and the students adapt to it. The teacher confuses the authority of knowledge with his or own personal, uh, professional authority, which he or she sets in opposition to the freedom of the students. The teacher is the subject. The pupil are, pupils are the objects. All right, I'm going to skip some of this in the interest of time and let Paolo speak for himself here. What is in being in the world in you that that calls your own attention to you? I I said I would I would say to you that I am a curious being. That I have been a curious being. But in a certain moment of, of the process of being curious, in order to understand the others, I discover that I have to create in myself a certain virtue without which it's difficult for me to understand the others. The virtue of tolerance. It is through the exercise of tolerance that I discover the rich possibility of doing things and learning different things with different people. Being tolerant is, is not a question of being naive. On the contrary, it is a duty to be tolerant, an ethical duty, a, a historical, a political duty. But it does not uh, demand from me to lose my my personality. Even though it is for me. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> I was wondering. Thank you, Wendy. Where are you going, Brass? Um, back. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so. I said I hope we could share some stories. I thought I'd share some stories of my own. My uh, father, Arthur Salyer, um, dropped out of school in the eighth grade 
as was not uncommon during his time to help his family. Uh, he went back and got his GED at 44, uh, and he was one of the best teachers I've ever known. He was one of the best teachers because he never stopped learning. And what Paolo says that I skipped over a little bit is that the essence of teaching and learning is dialogue. Dialogue, not dialectics. That's what Plato is talking about with this power structure, but dialogue where there is a mutual interest in moving into community and moving into freedom. And that was my dad. He was so proud. He raised three kids. We all have graduate degrees, although my brother's pretty dumb still. Um, and, and he was so proud that I had a PhD. He didn't quite understand it, but, you know, because it didn't translate into more money. Um, but uh, he was very proud. And I remember uh, one time I was home and he would always ask me questions like, you know, what does this mean? What do you think about this? What about that? And this time he had, he worked at the funeral home uh, in town the last 27 years of his life. And so he got to hear a lot of sermons and he was, he hated bad sermons and he would critique them mercilessly to the ministers. And so he said, <clears throat> I remember one time I was home and he said, you know where it says, Jesus says he can, if you have faith, you can move mountains. He's like, what does that mean? And I'm like, dad, it's hyperbole. It's just. You know, we say it all the time. Like, I almost died when I saw that happen. I didn't almost die. It's hyperbole. It's just a way of speaking. If you pray, you can move mountains. Sure. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's a pretty common expression. We just don't usually, I mean, pretty common figure of speech. We just don't usually associate it with the Bible. Though it's there. Every single minister he spoke to after that was quizzed on whether he knew what hyperbole was. <laughs> I also remember teaching a class, a philosophy class, um, and he had come to visit, <clears throat> and we were deep into the problem of evil. And here's my father, you know, 70-something, and I look up and his hands raised. <laughs> he adds to the discussion. The Tao Te Ching has been my guide for teaching especially this line. If you overesteem great men, people become powerless. If you overvalue possessions, people begin to steal. The, te the master, it reads here, but I always read it as the teacher. The teacher leads by emptying people's minds and filling their cores, by weakening their ambition and toughening their resolve. The master helps people lose everything they know everything they desire and creates confusion in those who think they know. Practice not doing and everything will fall into place. And then 65, chapter 65 from Tao Te Ching, the ancient masters didn't try to educate the people, but kindly taught them to not know. When they think that they know the answers, people are difficult to guide. When they know that they don't know, people can find their own way. If you want to learn how to govern, avoid being clever or rich. The simplest pattern is the clearest. <clears throat> and then um, one of my great teachers, Allen Ginsberg, called him the great wisdom teacher, Walt Whitman. From Song of the Open Road, here is the test of wisdom. Wisdom is not finally tested in schools. Wisdom cannot be passed from one having it to another not having it. Wisdom is of the soul, is not susceptible of proof, is its own proof, applies to all stages and objects and qualities, and is content, is the certainty and reality and the immortality of things and the excellence of things. Something there is in the float of the sight of things that provokes it out of the soul. Now I re-examine philosophies and religions. They may prove well in the lecture rooms, but not prove at all under the spacious clouds and the landscape and flowing currents. Two other things that have taught me in teaching, and that is travel. Um, I've never learned as much as when I've traveled. And it goes to Paolo's point, 
is that you cannot divorce people from the learning. And so people will teach you whether they intend to or not, especially if you visit them in their own communities and in their own places. Whether it's a diner on Route 66 or um, uh, a bar in Prague the one time. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, people will teach you. They want to learn. We want to learn. It's just we get, we let a power structure mediate our learning and our teaching. And then finally, teaching itself. I never learned so much as when I started teaching. Right? Nobody says that. Nobody ever tells us that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk of scholarship and what a PhD means or what a graduate degree means or what it means to be a teacher. But nobody ever says what it means is you get to be the best student ever. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>